Hi, my name is Marie Romagnano, founder of Healthcare Professionals for Divine Mercy. I'm happy to present to you our educational conferences that integrate medicine, bioethics, and the spirituality of divine mercy in patient care for healthcare professionals. Because of their importance, even if you're not a medical professional, we invite you to join us. Today I wish to offer a summary of a conference presentation given by Dr. Ron Sobex entitled, An Approach to Caring for Pediatric Hematology Oncology Patients. Dr. Sobex is a hematologist oncologist at the Tossic Cancer Institute from the Cleveland Clinic Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology. Dr. Sobeck starts his presentation by reviewing the incidences of pediatric cancer cases in the United States, along with the most common types of childhood malignancies. A case of childhood acute leukemia is then presented, including the need for prompt evaluation to establish the diagnosis. It is imperative for the healthcare providers to then take time to listen to patients and their families before explaining the nature of the disease and establishing a plan of care. Insightful parallels with spiritual healing, especially those drawn from the Diary of St. Faustina, are also presented. Dr. Sobex likewise explores the concept of vision, particularly with regards to fostering and understanding among patients and healthcare professionals. Treatment approaches are his next consideration. He demonstrates the principle of synergy when multiple therapeutic agents are combined. Such synergy also exists in the life of the spirit and the body of Christ. The presentation then focuses on the subject of consent and assent in patients, followed by learning lessons from past encounters. Further, Healthcare professionals are called to have a deep concern for everyone and to avoid the radical indifference which characterizes the culture of death. Such individuals can advance in holiness by striving to live virtuous lives with sincerity and simplicity. Finally, benign or non-malignant hematology conditions are reviewed with a particular focus on sickle cell disease. Inheritance patterns for this disease are discussed while consideration is also given to the inheritance pattern of sin. Conformational changes in sickle cell red blood cells results in occlusion of normal blood flow through the circulation and other complications. Similarly, conformational changes in the spiritual life from sin may also compromise a patient's overall health status. As adults seeking healing, we may learn tremendous things from the little ones in our midst. I invite you to listen to the complete presentation of Dr. Sobex on an approach to caring for pediatric hematology oncology patients. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Marie and Father Kaz and Father Seraphim once again for the privilege to come back to my favorite conference every year. And I think um, with regards to, I'm, I'm an adult hematologist oncologist, but I have had the, my first uh, rotation in medical school, clinical rotation was with the pediatric hematology guys. So, and, and so it's just a wonderful eye-opening experience with a lot of the beautiful children. And I really look up to those guys for a lot of uh, mentoring over the years. And still as adult oncologists, I think we, as we'll talk about, continue to learn tremendous things from our pediatric colleagues. So just by way of introduction, in the United States in 2016, it's been an estimated uh, 10,000 uh, new cases of cancer from children uh, from birth to 14 years of age, and about 1,200 of those children are expected to die from disease each year. Uh, childhood cancers make up less than 1% of all cancers uh, each year, and although pediatric cancer death rates have certainly declined by nearly 70% over the last four decades, uh, cancer remains to be a leading cause of death for, um, from disease among children. I think if we look back at the most common cancers of children, I'm a, I work with the hematologic cancers, particularly leukemia, so uh, that's been their number one problem. But then, of course, brain and spinal cord tumors, neuroblastoma, Wilms tumor, lymphoma less commonly, and then some sarcomas, rhabdomyosarcoma, uh, retinoblastoma, and bone cancers. 
Um, and the major, once again, most of these cases are occurring between uh, up to age 14. If you look at survival, 10-year uh, actuarial survival, well, that doesn't look too bad compared to us as adults. I mean, there are a number of them that have uh, recently, like retinoblastoma is basically close to 100% cure rate. But as you uh, move along down the line, uh, some of the other sarcomas and um, central nervous system tumors have survivals around 60%. And as a parent, that's usually not uh, great news that you want to hear for your child, although still the majority are getting cured. It's, it's not, uh, not everyone. And so there's a lot of work that continues to be needed to be done in this group. So I'd like to start also with a, a case. And um, uh, this was back many years ago. Uh, a young guy that I met, Brandon, I had the pleasure to help take care of uh, in my earlier days. And Brandon was a nine-year-old who presented with malaise and fatigue and some easy bruising. And at the time, he had uh, markedly abnormal white blood count, or blood counts, particularly high white blood count, and with further evaluation was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So you can imagine when you walk in the, your, your doc's office with your child, it was the only child that his parents had, this is marked disruption in normal family life. I mean, he was hospitalized immediately, taken out of school. His parents obviously were greatly concerned, and they had time away from home and work. And just this incredible uncertainty if Brandon would survive. So how do you and I respond to abrupt change in our lives? I mean, there's the classic negative approaches, fear, anxiety, sadness, anger, resentment, inability to concentrate, a loss of focus, discouragement, and probably worst of all, despair. But amidst these uh, abrupt changes, there certainly can be positives. It gives us often the time to take to reflect and question why acknowledge the possibility of the need for change and growth in our life in the first place. Remember that, once again, we're not alone. We all know here at this conference, God and others are intimately involved in our lives. It gives us a chance to adapt and redirect our lives with perhaps a new vision and purpose, and of course, offering up our sufferings with Jesus, and ultimately acceptance of God's holy will with trust. I think when we approach uh, not only Brandon, but other, other folks with the, the initial encounter, usually starts off with a prompt evaluation, time to listen, explain the nature of the disease, and then ultimately establish a plan of care. So with regards to Brandon's case, uh, in terms of establishing the diagnosis, it started with a bone marrow examination. And um, as uh, many of you know, that's where all of our blood cells are made. And one of the techniques you start off with is called flow cytometry where you can characterize actually the leukemia cell surface markers, because there's many, many different types of leukemia, and of that group, you know, establish what type they have, and then also for prognostic purposes, some are felt to be, or known to be better responsive therapy than others. Um, and then a whole host of cytogenetic and molecular studies to further characterize the disease and help with prognosis. This is not Brandon's slide, but it's just a, a representation of the of peripheral blood smear with a lot of these large uh, purple nuclei. These are basically the leukemic cells. You usually should never see any what we call blast in the peripheral blood in normal circumstances. And for Brandon, as in, in this case, there were a lot of these early cells floating around in the bloodstream. So even without a bone marrow examination, you can often establish a diagnosis. But how about us with regards to the spiritual life? I think that there has to be this prompt evaluation for troubled souls. Um, and St. Faustina, a, a, a wonderful mentor for many of us, uh, had this beautiful prayer I think many of you are familiar with, but the prayer for the grace to be merciful to others. And for her, as well as for us, it's this, to attend to this malignant condition called sin promptly. And she starts her beautiful prayer with the most holy trinity, as many times as I breathe, as many times as my heart beats, as many times as my blood pulsates through my body, so many thousand times do I want to glorify your mercy. I want to be completely transformed into your mercy and to be a living reflection, O Lord. May the greatest of all divine attributes, that of your unfathomable mercy, pass through my heart and soul to my neighbor. So once, as part of this prompt evaluation, you have this vision for patients as well, uh, hopefully a vision for a cure. So after establishing the diagnosis and getting a sense of the prognosis from the testing that you've done, you once again consider the patient's overall health status, their physical, mental, emotional, and psychological beings, and then envision this definitive treatment plan to bring about this healing. Now, if we look at over the years, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, 
the people I stand on their shoulders from the guys back in the 70s. Back in those days, the 10-year survival for childhood ALL was 10%. It was a pretty horrifying disease. But just within five years, with um, different combinations of chemotherapy, the improvement's up to 60% 10-year uh, survival. And as we moved into the 2000s, uh, there's been a 90% uh, survival. So it's a dr dramatic increase just over a period of you know, 30 years. And it's a little bit better to, uh, in certain circumstances now. So how do we share this vision, for instance, with, with Brandon, foster this understanding? Though you may know this as a doc, but as a patient on the other end of the, you don't know these numbers. So first of all, you want to assess things in your vision with, of course, uh, Brandon, but also his parents and his family. And then for the various members of the healthcare team, because not all healthcare providers are cancer docs or cancer nurses. And I think there again, everyone has to know that there's this chance for healing and cure. And uh, we want to make sure everyone's on the same playing field. But the Lord also has this tremendous vision for all of his creation according to his divine will. And there's been the paradigm that sight and vision, we think of sight, of course, as the physical sense of seeing, and vision is seeing as God sees with understanding. And I think we uh, clearly came to appreciate that if we just back a few weeks ago in Lent with the, the blind man that Jesus cured in St. John's Gospel. Of course, uh, he not only received his physical sight, but had this tremendous vision that the Pharisees and those who didn't believe our Lord lacked. Moving on, St. Faustina takes it from there with continuing her prayer. She said, help me, O Lord, that my eyes may be merciful so that I may never suspect or judge from appearances but look what is beautiful in my neighbor's soul and come to their rescue. So with regards to, um, with, back to Brandon's case, one of my uh, colleagues I've known for many years, named Michael, he had shared with me this uh, infant's vision of God, if you would, in the sense when he reflected um, with his own mother as a child, for instance, thinking about Brandon with his parents, how his mother had this deep love for him, but he reflected on his own mother's loving gaze for him as a little infant, and he saw the face of God while nursing and looking intently into his mother's eyes. But then 50 years later, as Michael and I sort of grew up, uh, his mother had dementia, and he looked intently into her eyes as they prayed the rosary as they were accustomed to do, and he saw the face of God still um, 50 years later. And this was really was an opportunity for him as he reflected for compassion and let his mother see the Lord's face through him as she struggled. And once again, we're all intimately in this in the body of Christ. So from vision, of course, it's time to listen. So I think to start with, with Brandon, you may have started off with Brandon, tell me how you feel and what has been going on with you. This little boy's pulled out of his life. Mom and dad, what have you noticed? Have others such, uh, others such as teachers seen changes with Brandon before he presented in the hospital? And how long that's been going on? And what's your understanding of this condition? And from this initial information that we have shared with you, what questions and concerns do you have? Because as many of us know, as people come into the hospital with uh, traumatic experiences, there's lots of people coming and going. And you, if they mem remember 10% of what you say the first visit, you're lucky. So you want to get a sense how much they're processing and understanding. And yes, you have to repeat over and over sometimes, but just listen and be still. That presence that we just heard about so critical. And St. Faustina carrying on with her prayer, help me that my ears may be merciful so that I may give heed to my neighbor's need and not be indifferent to their pains and moanings. So after we listened, then we've had the chance as healthcare providers is, uh, to explain the nature of the disease. So as I you know, start off, you know, leukemia is a, a condition of bone marrow failure where there's uh, what we call cytopenias and extramedullary spread. So with regards to cytopenias, for those aren't in medicine, various low blood counts, anemia, which can result in fatigue, shortness of breath, low platelet counts, thrombocytopenia results in bruising, and then the leukopenia, or the paucity of white blood cells, can result in profound immunodeficiency and various infections. Now, when we talk about extramedullary spread, the type of leukemia Brandon had, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, has this tendency not only to um, stay in the bloodstream and the bone marrow, but it can infiltrate other areas, if you will, certain sanctuary sites, such as the central nervous system, where patients could present with various neuro neurologic deficits, pain, headaches, uh, stroke-like appearances, um, 
for young boys, they can present also with a testicular mass um, and various cutaneous lesions as well. So with, as we try to be merciful and explain things to our patients, St. Faustina has a, been a wonderful coach as she continues on, says, help me, O Lord, that my tongue may be merciful so that I should never speak negatively of my neighbor, but have a word of comfort and forgiveness for all. So with that background then, for Brandon and others, you have to establish this plan of care. Now, ALL is uh, one of the most intense uh, uh, in, in long treatment regimens in the book for all of oncology. And you start off with an induction chemotherapy phase to try to induce a remission. It takes about a month to do that um, with a combination of chemotherapy, sometimes to, uh, irradiation, um, as we'll move on to the second part called central nervous system prophylaxis. Because about 25% of people, if they don't have leukemia in their central nervous system, it's going to go there. So as part of all these regimens, patients get uh, prophylactically either chemotherapy or prophylactic cranial spinal radiation to uh, prevent it from going there. And then various phases of intensification therapies. And ultimately, when people are in remission for years, they stay on maintenance therapy to help try to eradicate any minimal residual disease and prevent it from coming back. So with regards to, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but there are many chemotherapy agents, but some broad classes, anthracyclines, asparaginase, cyclophosphamide, cytarabine, I, I can read through the names, but there's steroids. Uh, been around for many, many years. Before World War II, people used steroids. Our bodies make steroids, and, and they're still effective part of the therapy. Um, but with each of these drugs, as you can imagine, um, they're toxins, and they have potential side effects and toxicities. But, uh, but with each of the agents, there's different mechanisms and actions that I have down here. And in many regards, they're complementary. They work together in different facets to help increase that potential for response and cure. I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to read this one. It's a very busy slide. But, um, but just to show that, that in some, many regards, it's like to joke around with people that if, if a patient gets, says, let me have a copy of my treatment plan for the next two, three years, you can lay out something like this. And it's like a recipe in many regards. But each of these little uh, uh, symbols are a different chemotherapy agent. And just as the years went by, people built on themes. Like in 1970, it had been christine and prednisone. And, you know, and as the years went by, the, Three is better than two, and <laughs> just keep building up. And so that got to the point where there's this over 90% cure rate. But it's very meticulously followed, and it depends whether patients have standard risk disease or more high risk disease. But once again, uh, uh, it's things that you've learned from the future of building on a theme. So the entity or the concept really is what we call synergy. So it's this correlated action or cooperation by two or more drugs. It's not simply an additive effect. And of course, our Lord's been a master of this for a long time, far before us, with regards to spiritual uh, synergy in the spiritual life. And in St. Faustina's diary, one of the passages that always sort of caught my ear with regards to this, um, he said to St. Faustina, do not be afflicted if your heart often experiences repugnance and dislike for sacrifice. All its power rests in the will. And so these contrary feelings, far from lowering the value of the sacrifice in my eyes, will enhance it, this synergy. And although you will not feel my presence on some occasions, I will always be with you. Do not fear, my grace will be with you. And of course, as the body of Christ, we have our Lord as our a model, of course, and our Blessed Mother, but many of you are religious, and our, our priests have been a wonderful role models and part of that, but uh, families and all people of all walks of life, including those suffering on the street, cancer patients, and all of us has the opportunity to pull together and offer all things up to the Lord. So although I mentioned that survival is considerably improved, not, unfortunately not all children are cured and there's still need for further clinical investigation. So more children uh, tend to go on clinical trials than adults, believe it or not. And what we've learned from the children has clearly helped adults over the years, I can attest to that. And one of the premier examples I'll give you in more recent years was um, we talk about AYAs, or older adolescents and young adults. So these are the kids after age 14 into their early 20s. Um, and so although I mentioned survival is about 90% for most of the children with ALL, ALL um, the older adolescents and young adults have event free for survivals historically only 30 to 45%. Um, so the differences in outcomes say, why, why is there these big differences? Well, they, in some regards, been attributed to heterogeneous disease biology, 
different host factors between the patients and therapy given. And then there had been a lot of comment about experiencing the treating providers. Some people said, is it just the pediatric oncologist who are just better docs than the adult oncologist? And, you know, it's a humbling thought. But on the other hand, um, they, they tend to be fairly aggressive in delivering the therapy on the money, whereas an older uh, oncologist, we might say, well, I'm not sure this guy can handle this next dose. Maybe we'll skip this week or we'll delay. And sometimes these delays may, you know, it might be nice for the preventing toxicity, but they're unfortunately not doing much to, or achieving those um, long-term results that you see in the kids. So, but with regards to the, another concept was that these older adolescents and young adults may have had worse outcomes due to low rates of clinical trial enrollment. Historically, less than 2% of the older adolescents went on trials versus 60% for pediatric patients. So a lot of people would say, well, you know, they took their child and they um, went for it, if you will, or some adolescents might say, ah, I don't think I want to do that. So one of the classic big studies that just came out, we were pleased to be a participant in, it's called, um, with regards to these improved outcomes, was the U.S. Intergroup uh, Trial C10403. And this trial ran from November 2007 through December 2012, where there were 318 adolescents, uh, young adults, between ages 60, and they eventually raised it up to age 39, so they're not adolescents, but they needed some extra people to accrue. And they treated people with the standard um, arm of a children's oncology regimen, and they found that the toxicities were very manageable with the very low treatment-related mortality, only 3% of people dying going through the therapy. And the treatment with this pediatric re regimen was found to be feasible when administered by an adult hematologist oncologist to uh, this population up to age 40. And what they showed from the study well, more recently is that the two-year of rent-free survival was 66% and the overall survival was 78%, so markedly better than what we saw with the old therapies. Now, this is not 10-year data yet, so we still got to follow these people out, I don't, but in regards, it's still very encouraging. And given these initial encouraging results, the U.S. cooperative groups are planning a subsequent study using this same regimen and the addition of novel targeted air agents in an effort to further improve outcomes. I think if we look back to uh, learning from the young, this is nothing new for the Lord. Back in the Old Testament, uh, we heard a little bit earlier uh, from the prophet Daniel, from uh, Father Seraphim, and I, I just... Uh, this is a, one of these stories that always was near and dear to my heart. And I, um, for those who aren't familiar with Susanna and Daniel, uh, Susanna was this wonderful, beautiful, pure woman who was married but two older uh, Israelite elders uh, strongly lusted for her, and they, she would not give in to their desires. And so they falsely acclaimed her of adultery with someone else, and she was, they believed the two older guys, so they sentenced her to death. And uh, on the way to execution, the Lord, of course, stirred up uh, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of a young boy named Daniel. And he cried out, I will have no part in the death of this woman. And the people said, what are you, what are you saying? And he goes, are you such fools? <laughs> Israel, these guys have testified falsely against her. And he took back and he cross-examined them and then convicted them of perjury and saved Susanna. And they were put to death instead. So the Lord can use the little ones to continually, and he does all the time, to teach people of their pride uh, tremendous lessons. I think the church, too, also has been considered over time this an evolution from infancy to adulthood. If we think back in the early days of uh, the uh, apostolic period, um, people considered the church as an infancy, toddler stage, just learning how to walk. But then in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, this period of childhood, maybe not a lot of things being recorded. And then in adolescence, uh, um, it, People sometimes think of people being a little bit more combative, like in the days of the uh, Crusades, people, the younger guys flexing their muscles, showing their power. And then as enlightenment comes along with the Great Awakening in the teenage years, as people begin to increase their studies and into the more modern areas, some people consider the church in the adulthood, although we, we may have many more years to go. But great, great teachers, St. John Paul II, um, our current pope, with this tremendous uh, insight, St. Faustina and the Divine Mercy Masters, a lot of great saints, and just to see this, this evolution throughout the church history, once again, learning from the young. But the church, of course, today can still look, learn tremendous lessons from the infant church. We, we look back, and we've just been reading in the Acts of the Apostles now in the Easter season, that they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread and to prayers. The community of believers was of one heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they had everything in common. With great power, the apostles bore witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great favor was accorded them all. So I think today, you don't have to 
mention anyone here a lot of the trouble we have in our world, but not only looking back at the early church, even when people look back at the Dark Ages, if you will, they said it's been called the Dark Age, not because uh, people were doing bad, just that there wasn't a lot of things recorded, but there were a lot of tremendous saints back in those days. For those who have the Magnificat and read these, about these saints in the 700s, 800s. But back then, at least in Europe, most of the world was Christian or Catholic, and there again, they had that faith. And I, I think, unfortunately, in our world today, a lot of that's lacking, and we may well be in the Dark Ages compared to them. As we move back to Brandon about our therapies, um, there's this period of parental consent and childhood assent. So when you present to the parents, so uh, we have this long two, three years of therapy coming up, you mention with regard, what are the risks? What are the benefits? So hopefully we'll cure this. The alternatives if we don't do this, the various equipment involved and the personnel, the healthcare providers. But for children of, of at least of, uh, of, of some, some uh, mindset and age, about age 7 to 17, they need to also assent to this program. And so a child needs to be able to express an understanding of the treatment. And it's an ongoing process as they grow up with providers. And you have to be creative, you use written forms, sometimes videos, graphics, other visual aids to help explain the trial and teach the little guy what they're going to be going through day by day. And also be very open for that presence once again to encourage the child to ask questions. But not surprisingly, we also need spiritual assent. Each of us are presented various trials throughout our lives. And we're, uh, we may not fully understand the risks, benefits, the alternatives, and the people involved with such events. But of course, our Lord and our Blessed Mother completely understand. And they actually consent on our behalf, knowing full well what is of our best interest, just like Brandon's parents did for him. But as children, as uh, spiritual children, we need to pray and seek understanding and then ultimately assent to undergo these trials with the hope for improved spiritual healing and growth. With regards to Brandon's clinical course, after that initial induction therapy, he fortunately was able to achieve a complete remission, a repeat of bone marrow biopsy, and there was no visible signs of leukemia. He was supported aggressively with blood product transfusions, various antimicrobial therapies, antiemetics, a lot of emotional support. Uh, the help of child life specialists who are very attuned to the young guys as well, support offered for his parents. And with the clinical improvement, ultimately he could get back to school. But there was frequent ongoing treatments, blood draws, and other follow-up visits that became really a common part of his life, just like other little kids doing homework and playing with his friends. It was just part of the day. And long-term follow-up visits to assess for relapse and late effects. Unfortunately, for those cured uh, pediatric cancer patients, there sometimes can be late effects or problems, and about 75% have chronic medical conditions, and these are severe or fatal for about 40%, so they're not going to make it to their 80, at least in the past they haven't. But with regards to, there's also this concern for increased risk of secondary cancers as they age. A cancer therapy may compromise the child's growth and fertility and endocrine systems, chronic immunodeficiency states for some that may predispose them to infections. For those who receive cranial radiation, that could result in significant cognitive impairment, particularly if you're given at a very young age, like one or two years old. The cancer treatments also, once again, can have physical and neurocognitive disabilities that may prevent full participation in school, social activities, and later even in work. And some, this can result in depression and loneliness and difficulty perhaps later getting married, finding employment, or just applying for health or life insurance. But fortunately for Brandon, he had a little bit different outlook, I think. Uh, far beyond his physical healing, Brandon came to recognize that he was not alone during his years of treatment. As he experienced psychological, emotional, and mental healing as well, his caregivers really became his friends and who he and his uh, parents came to trust and love. And his outlook on life was considerably different, as you can imagine, than most children his age, as he grew to appreciate the precious gift of life and health. And I think uh, Pope Francis, uh, one of my heroes, as many of yours, um, helps remind us it's just through an unbroken chain of witnesses that we come to see the face of Jesus. So in our healthcare climate, now we can be that face. Don't have to be in healthcare, of course, to do it, but we have unique opportunities every day. Now, along the line, uh, another case I wanted, well, uh, another colleague, we're going to say Michael, uh, um, was a hematologist who helped care with Brandon back 14 years ago when I was back there. And 
had a son named Casey who was eight years old, um, who presented also with petechiae from the low platelets, cytopenias, and atypical lymphocytes in his peripheral blood, and this was during Holy Week in 2005. Casey was evaluated by Mitchell, who was an older pediatric hematologist oncologist who'd been around for many, many years. But Michael, um, he's a pretty bright guy but in, in, in academic world, but he did not previously perhaps regard Mitchell as a great physician because he wasn't really a known, well-known academician and he's a general hematologist, oncologist, good guy, but not, not a leukemia specialist. But at the time, he sensed Mitchell's unease and lack of comfort with him, perhaps since he had not developed his career in academic medicine as Michael was trying to do. But despite that, yet as his little boy faced a potentially life-threatening leukemia, he felt somewhat helpless. And Mitchell's compassionate, prompt care helped calm Michael. A bone marrow exam was scheduled for Good Friday. And after Michael and I attended Holy uh, uh, Mass on Holy Thursday, there was a, profession, a procession of the Holy Eucharist through the church. And during this time, Michael shared that you know, he was praying to, to our Heavenly Father that his most holy will be done regarding his son. He recalled how the Father, of course, had offered his only begotten Son for the salvation of the world. He also recalled how Father Abraham was prepared to offer up the son Isaac to the Lord with just faithfully trusting. But on Good Friday morning, when Casey presented to the schedule for the scheduled bone marrow exam, his blood counts had recovered, and the lymphocytosis and cytopenias had improved. It was felt he's probably just had a viral process that knocked down his blood counts rather than a leukemia. So Michael immediately thanked the Lord for his divine mercy, sparing his son, while recalling how the father still gave up his son for the world on that day. And he also developed a profound respect for Mitchell and expressed his sincere gratitude. Um, and the relationship grew into a friendship that he really treasured. As St. Faustina's prayer continues, as, um, think about this with Mitchell, that older doc with hands and feet full of compassion, said, help me, O Lord, that my hands may be merciful and filled with good deeds, so that I may do only good to my neighbors and take upon myself the more difficult and toilsome tasks. Help me that my feet may be merciful so that I may hurry to assist my neighbor, overcoming my fatigue and weariness. My true rest is in the service of my neighbor. But as the years went on, um, we can continue to learn from the past. And 11 years after this time, Michael found himself surrounded by many new, bright, younger colleagues. He was no longer the young buck growing up in the academic world. And some of these younger guys have been highly successful in research and clinical practice. And at times, this made Michael feel uncomfortable, like Mitchell probably did many years before. And because he just, Michael didn't feel he had the same talents that these younger guys did. And in particular, he sensed that some of the younger physicians recognized his limitations. But although there was this temptation for Michael to be insecure from this, he chose to thank God for his younger colleagues' gifts as well as his own. And rather than give in to resentment, he chose to love and chose love and compassion as Mitchell had showed him many years before. And as Michael's son then went off to college, he started to drift away from the faith, which caused Michael profound distress. And unlike uh, the prior concern for leukemia, just as a threat to his physical well-being uh, as a child, now his spiritual life was being abruptly threatened. So Michael prayed fervently to the Lord, the Most Blessed Mother, and as well as the saints, including Saints Monica and Augustine, for his son. And he didn't cry much, but this time he definitely shed tears, not merely for his son, but as he shared with me, it's more for the insult that this was to our Lord. And so he really came to appreciate, it's not just uh, um, simply enough to pray for his son's conversion, but he had an obligation to do this for all souls, reflecting on our Lord's words, the suffering servant in Isaiah. It's too little, he says, for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I'll make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So I think one of the things that we get stuck in in this, um, in this culture of death, if you will, is radical indifference. And with the culture of death, there's many uh, faces to it. Of course, abortion, euthanasia, human trafficking, hate, and terrorism. But probably the, the premier thing, when people think of what is the opposite of love, it's not really hate, but it's indifference, just, just complete sloth or lack of any care for others. And St. Teresa of Avila reminds us of this. She says, do not suppose that after advancing the soul to such a state, God abandons it so easily that it is light work for the devil to regain it. 
When his majesty sees it leaving him, he feels the loss so keenly that he gives it in many a way a thousand secret warnings which reveal to it the hidden danger. In conclusion, let us strive to make constant progress, she said. We ought to feel great alarm if we do not find ourselves advancing, for without doubt the evil one must be planning to injure us in some way. It is impossible for a soul that has come to this state not to go still farther, for love is never idle. Therefore, it is a very bad sign when one comes to a standstill in virtue. And with regards to St. Faustina, also taking off on this, with regards to the, the combat, this radical indifference is radical mercy. And she continu <laughs> continues her beautiful prayer. Help me, O Lord, that my heart may be merciful, so that I myself may feel all the sufferings of my neighbor. I will refuse my heart to no one. I'll be sincere even with those who I know will abuse my kindness, and I will lock myself up in the most merciful heart of Jesus. I will bear my own sufferings in silence. May your mercy, O Lord, rest upon me. I think we have to be, with regards to not only, not only indifference, but to be people of sincerity as our childlike examples. Are we striving really for the truth? And St. Jose Maria Scriva, the founder of Opus Dei, wrote, you know, may your behavior and your conversation be such that everyone who sees or hears you can say, this man reads the life of Jesus Christ. And also as children, to pursue that simplicity. I think as adults, and certainly in healthcare, we tend to complicate and live, live very complicated lives. We keep setting more and more agendas, pack more in each day, but are we really happy though? Are we finding fulfillment in life as we race from one task or event to another? Sometimes our little buddies just teach us, you know, slow down and see what matters, enjoy the moment. So with regards to simplicity, yes, we should not, should we not try to limit our worldly ambitions in exchange for spiritual treasures? And starting just with time for some silence, listen to hear the Lord's voice often in the soft whispers of life and look and pray for the Lord's vision. Going back to the Old Testament where we continue to learn from uh, Prophet Elijah with regards to the Lord said, and go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord and behold the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And then we hear, if you read on, Elijah covered his face and went to the entrance of the cave to, to speak with the Lord in that whisper. So I, I spent a lot of this most of this talk going through with regards to malignant conditions, but in hematology, if you will, we, the conditions we call benign or non-malignant hematology. And there's, I'm not going to read them all here, but there's plenty of different anemias in childhood, uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, von Willebrand's disease. But one I wanted to just touch upon was the hemoglobinopathies, and one that you may, I think, as most medical folks are fairly familiar with, is sickle cell disease. Um, so before we touch base with that, I just wanted, for those who aren't hematologists or really don't care about any of this, I'll give me 10 seconds to explain this. But with regards to our normal hemoglobin in life, that in our red blood cells that carry oxygen, it's designated hemoglobin A. And it has a tetramer of two alpha chains and two beta chains, alpha 2, beta 2. There's a, group, a smaller population, less than 3%, called hemoglobin A2, which is alpha 2, delta 2. And then when we're in our mother's womb, before we get to that point, we have hemoglobin F, which is alpha, delta, gamma, delta. So I'll bring that up while that's important in a few minutes, but just to give some of the groundwork. But with regards to sickle cell disease, um, as I mentioned before, hemoglobin A is two alpha chains and two beta chains. But with regards to um, sickle cell, with the, uh, uh, there's a valine substituted for glutamine in the sixth position of the beta globin chain. I, I hate to bore people with the molecular biology here, but, but regardless, with this conformational change, as patients with sickle cell experience low oxygen stress, uh, infections, stress, um, it, it causes their red blood cells to sickle, if you will, and I'll show you a slide then in a minute, where they have this rigid cell wall with increased viscosity. It's very difficult for these types of red blood cells to pass through the capillaries, and they plug up things, obstructing them, causing tissue, organ, pain, and infarcts, what we call painful crises. This is just a visual representation of that. Um, the top is hemoglobin A is the normal um, hemoglobin, and hemoglobin S for sickle cell. 
and there had been a change in the DNA from an adenosine to a threonine, which ultimately, if you look down the line, what happens is the amino acid is changed from a glutamic acid to a valine. And it's a little defect, but it causes a lot of problems. So this schema, you can skip the top part because we already talked about it, but just as we move downstream, what are the clinical manifestations? Well, as you break down the red blood cells, patients experience physical weakness, anemia, and even can experience heart failure as a little guy. As the cells are clumped or clogging up the small vessels, it once again causes pain and fevers, and if it affects the brain, it can cause strokes and paralysis, certainly impaired mental function. It can accumulate in the spleen, which can cause various pain and damage, and um, the kidneys and other organs can be affected as well. So it really can be a very catastrophic process for, and a lot of these people are very younger, younger kids with this and getting into their young adulthood stage. If you were to look at the peripheral blood smear, um, I don't have a good pointer here, but a lot of these little sickles, you know, the, the normal red blood cells are a biconcave disc, but some of the sickle-shaped ones are what we're talking about. So one of the questions has come, are there seemingly benign insults to the soul? I said that's benign hematology. So though sickle cell disease is not a malignant condition, it still results in significant morbidity and mortality, a lot more deaths every year, and it's not actually benign, unlike childhood ALL, which has got about a 90% cure rate. We don't have a 90% cure rate for sickle cell, so you can question where the word benign is fitting. Um, but likewise, not all sin is considered deadly or mortal sin, but any sin committed is not benign. If we look at the catechism, of course, uh, it defines venial sin, weakens charity, it manifests a disorder affection for created goods, and impedes the soul's progress in the exercise of the virtues and the practice of the moral good, and it merits temporal punishment. And deliberate and unrepentant venial sin disposes us little by little to commit mortal sin. So if we get back to sickle cell just for a brief moment, there, the inheritance pattern is pretty straightforward. If you think the, the normal uh, gene for the beta globin genes in the dark red and the sickle cell is in the pink, and depending on how the genes get passed on, there's a 25% chance that uh, patients are gonna be homozygous for sickle cell um, beta globin, and they're again have sickle cell anemia. Unfortunately, that inheritance pattern for sin is not that straightforward. It's just a destructive or evil lifestyle certainly can affect many others, and it's not just a 25% chance. It can, one downstream effect from a parent or a grandparent can have an avalanche of uh, 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 evil passed on through the family or a ripple effect affecting many others. If we look at um, sickle cell again, the top, uh, um, corner on the, that's the normal circulation where the red blood cells are going through the capillaries, but the figure below where the sickle cells are having difficulty getting through the capillaries, they plug up things. And these conformational changes result in occlusion in the normal blood flow. So uh, the little hand here is what we call dactylitis, where the extremities can be just plugged up and can be absolutely extremely painful, as you can imagine, uh, and being set up for infection as well. If these uh, circulations plugged up in the chest, acute chest syndrome can be extremely painful and hypoxia and shortness of breath and um, can be life-threatening as well. But with regards to conformational changes within one with regards to the sin, um, of course, this disfigures the soul and the God-giving dignity of a child of God. And like sickle cell, which impedes the blood flow, here sin, of course, impedes the life-giving flow of the Lord's graces, which while stifling the Holy Spirit's action in one's life, just like a bunch of debris plugging up a river. How do we manage sickle cell? There's, well, I'm not going to go through every management, but one of the interesting features is an old chemotherapy drug called hydroxyurea. Um, I showed you the earlier few slides back about hemoglobin F, the fetal hemoglobin, and what hydroxyurea has been able to do is to um, increase the hemoglobin F levels a bit, and, and therefore, there's hopefully less hemoglobin S that will polymerize and cause occlusions and painful crises. There's decreased hemolysis, and it can help increase the red blood count. On the flip side, it can have some vascular effects with the circulation. Um, and uh, there again, but overall, uh, the hydroxyurea for those has the potential to improve the tissue's oxygenation and decreased inflammation to help patients feel better. Now, in more severe cases, where you really have to get rid of the sickle cells, there's a thing called a red blood cell exchange transfusion, where this apheresis machine, you basically are taking out the patient's uh, blood, their sickle cells, and you're pouring in flush, fresh uh, hemoglobin A <laughs> with, uh, from a normal uh, blood donor. So uh, there again, it's been a, a life-saving treatment for some people, so for instance, with acute chest syndrome or strokes. 
But also with regards to uh, treatment of sickle cell in the past oh, um, years, often patients died between ages 20 and 40. And with uh, more recent treatments, uh, the life has been up to 50 and even beyond for some patients. And I work in bone marrow transplant, and it, it certainly can be done, and it's a bigger interest for the National Institute of Health. Um, uh, and it has high success rates, but there's still potential uh, death rates that are not inconsequential. So it's been really restricted in some regards for more severe cases or patients who've had a stroke or something, some of their uh, more severe clinical manifestations of sickle cell. But I think all of us are called once again to conform our lives to Christ and allow his God's graces to flow through us like a torrent, bringing everyone in our path, um, including ourselves, to him. I think we're called to be conduits of divine mercy of the world. And as St. Faustina concluded her prayer, um, she said, you yourself commend, command me to exercise the three degrees of mercy. The first, the act of mercy of what of kind. The second, the word of mercy. If I cannot carry out a work of mercy, I will assist by words. And the third prayer. If I cannot show mercy by deeds or words, I can always do so by prayer. My prayer reaches out even where I cannot reach out physically. Oh, my Jesus, transform me into yourself, for you can do all things. And I think uh, lessons that we learned from children like Brandon have helped a lot of us hematologists, oncologists, taking care of adults to bring healing to our adult patients. And if we go back to the Old Testament, as I like to do, um, back with um, Isaiah, that beautiful chapter in 11, where he wrote basically the calf and the young lion shall browse together with a little child to guide them. And the Lord continues to use us. And just in final conclusion, as Father Kaz uh, mentioned earlier, in 10 days will be the, uh, the beginning of the centen well, centennial for Our Lady of Fatima. And just as our, our Blessed Mother um, followed suit, basically, and continues this message of mercy throughout the world through her little ones, teaching us how, as adults and people of all walks of life, as the little children, to get down on our knees and pray the rosary, offer up our sacrifices in reparation for all the bad out there in the world. And this really is the means that the, the Lord uses to help change, change the world and bring about healing to so many who are in such deep, great need of healing. And with that, I'll end Jesus, I trust in you. Thank you for viewing our program. Please see our website, divinemercymatters.org, for additional educational resources. Thank you.